All right, I just want to check, can everyone hear me? Ah, uh, yes, you are audible. All right, for the POI, I'll take one POI from CO probably at a particular time. All right, former colonies have already stripped off the resources. Uh, former colonizers have already done a lot of harm to their former colonies. As a clear characterization and problem statement, right? First is that these domestic policies of these former colonies are currently receiving unnecessary sensationalism and also causing deadlocks on their congregations, uh, on their, on their legislations, right? Especially with the political expansionist propensities of former colonizers, right? So this commenting doesn't do any benefit in the short term and even in the long term. Secondly, this comments of states to their former colonies is also not a not necessarily a consensus of their people, but has something to do with the very political agendas of those in power of their states, such as them trying to reclaim again their power and their former power, right? Thirdly, is that there is no contextualization in the frame of reference and in the comments that they are saying, right? They're only saying the comments that only benefits their image and not that of the, the former colonies, right? So the burdens here in this value assessment debate is firstly that we would prove it's in the best interest of these Fine. states and also their former colonies later. And secondly, it's in the best interest of their social economic ties, right? So our model here in our value assessment debate is six pronged, right? Firstly, is that in terms of the freedom and the sovereignty of their former colonies, right? It, it is harmed. And why is that? Because for example, the US commenting to the Philippines bringing back the death penalty or these uh, extrajudicial killings, which they haven't proven, uh, it actually, be Philippines became reclusive to US, which was its former colonizer, thus gaining and seeking help from other, uh, um, other countries like China, which has severed its economic uh, investments to the USA. And thus, in terms of international relations, it doesn't have any pragmatic benefit. And secondly, in terms of uh, in cultural imperialism, right, it brings back this, and it's very harmful as well, because the sinocentrism them. Colonies would feel they are being made feel that they are lesser and that they need another help, right? That they need their colonizer again, which is not okay. And then Point. it's important to characterize how domestic policies work. Domestic uh, democratic institutions are already enough in our countries. Only having another comment or intrusion from a former colonizer is only a disruption to such order. The check and balance is already working. Yeah, I'm answering that POI. Three, two, hello, POI. Do you think that the Palestinian government should have the ability to criticize the government of Israel? All right, I would answer that with my constructives. So uh, the third prong in this model is in terms of our exclusive benefits, right? We have to empower these former colonies. And the trickle down effect of this is that they, ga they gain to trust their very own state that they don't need another comment from, their, from the state that has colonized them before or educating or trying to comment them, which would, which would just make feel the people on the ground that they need education or that they lack it, which they really don't, which they just need need some push and also some trust as well, right? And such empowerment, which only exists if we won't uh, if we won't have more upheavals, which will only be caused by commenting. Fourth is that up might say it brings more balance to power on their side, but I don't think so. In our best case, because the people's public pressure and media vanguards are safeguards already, it's enough. And in our worst case, this upheavals or crisis will only be exacerbated on the counterfactual of up, thus causing more unnecessary international sensationalism and comments can be easily misconstrued, right? Fifth prong is that we would make sure that no one abuses the process making of these domestic policies, and we don't want any infiltration from any comments, such as the USA, uh, destabilizing the Partido Comunista ng Pilipinas of the Philippines, which has damaged because, again, of its comments, right? And sixth is that uh, in terms of the trade-off, we trade off any and other comments from the allies of the states, the former colonies, because in terms of jurisdiction, they have no legitimacy on a principled level does it stand right? The standards then is firstly, uh, the standard is that first we think that it would bring more harm than the good that it would bring right. And secondly, we think that it only exacerbates the upheavals uh, that's happening or any or any emergence of any uh, controversial issue that would bring more harm in a country. More substance and constructive. Firstly, in terms of neocolonialism, right? We think that these 
former colonists would feel that they are being taken and that they have lesser sovereignty and that they should therefore it is not right for these states to comment on them the analysis here is simple that there is no contextualization of these comments from uh from states right in their frame of reference and even if there would be contextualization it would be something that is framed to be very biased to them and that would benefit them and not the state that has taken that would take care and also of those that would be in the best interest of their former colonists right and the structural reason answered un under this is that we need these very nuances of these domestic policies that these states of the former colonies can necessarily understand, right? So the harms on the counterfactual of op is simple. Firstly, it would receive more backlash from the state and from the from the former colonizers and its constituents as well. And secondly, there would be reclusivity. And th for example, there would be unnecessary sanctions which would only make the state more reclusive and more repulsive and hypervigilant. And such hypervigilant behavior would actually be an irrational response to a rational thing that they are doing right. And thirdly, is that these former colonies, uh, these former colonizers have the pro have the propensity to be domineering and the tendency to infiltrate the economy or the politics again of their former uh, colonies, thus damaging any do, any uh, democ democratic principle that th this particular country is having, such as the multipartisanship that the Philippines is having, which the U.S. is trying to, to be homogenous, to be bipartisan like them, which is definitely not what the Filipinos want, right? And the second constructive that's important here in this debate, which is which the op also has to respond to is that this commenting would actually be easily misconstrued and would be seen as a savior complex or as a messianic tendency, which would just not only make these uh, former colonies feel uh, lesser, but would also make them make the gap bigger, right? And which make them not only hyper vigilant, but would also accrue future international relations uh, harms, right? Such as the ICC being used by the US to pressure its former colony, the Philippines. Philippines, right? Even if the Filipinos themselves do not see anything wrong in terms of the, the drug war and other stuff like that, right? That has bring peace, right? And order, right? So you see that it disrupts the order. And so what happens then as an impact is that there's a culture of distrust to the very state thus harming any future growth in terms of the, the sustainability and the quality itself of the check and balance that they already have. It only disrupts the growing order, thus it harms them. Uh, we've never been more proud to propose. Thank you. Uh, within that, I would like to call letter of opposition to start the office. Here, here. Hi. Um, just to confirm, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are clearly audible. Thank you. Um, I prefer POIs in uh, vocally, so I think you can just unmute your mic because I won't be reading the chat. Uh, thank you. All right. Starting in three, two, one. In the status quo, everyone and every single banjo could agree that current non-Western world in its current states, we are a product or a symptom of colonial actions of the past. No one is disputing that, right? Iraq's and Iraq and Turkey's arbitrary ethno divisions by border lines because of Britain's negligence in dividing the border via, uh, via their own planning and systemic planning, right? And their foreign interests in the past, or like Malaysia's constant racial discourse that's always very volatile and very negative towards minorities uh, as a whole because there's previous divisions by the British colonizers, right? Sure, these nations screwed over many other nations and we fully acknowledge that, but here are, there are some values that we think even though they have had a bloody hand in creating a, a systemic problem in other nations, they should resolve to actually comment and actually resolve on helping them without and through the uh, uh, at the ex, uh, and the buck stops at direct physical intervention. We are okay with them talking about democracy. We are okay with them talking about human rights as a whole and how nations should respect uh, human rights as a whole. What are the some characterizations that are a little bit missing on the PM speech, right? What do past colonial look, uh, powers look like and why do they have so much influence? It looks like the UK and the US where they have significant international influence over the world. For example, like the UK, they have a commonwealth and they are the center of the commonwealth where they literally have strong foreign policy power and could influence uh, 
soft power throughout the international organizations, right? Some formal influence that these nations have, like the UK, is like treaties via, like in Hong Kong or in previously Malaysia, where the, uh, a British judge could actually sit on judicial cases and hear and give his particular opinion, right? Those are the, the nations that are very powerful, but we think that the main debate focuses on the discourse of those nations regarding other nations and whether that discourse should be legitimate and should be allowed. It's not about whether they should actually conquer the other nations. It's, that's out of the debate, right? Significant military influence could be also seen by this kind of like uh, nations where they have uh, they can influence the United Nations Security Council, the General Assembly. They have strong veto power on this kind of international organizations, the IMF and NATO, where they can actually influence and actually donate and significant uh, foreign aid. We will say why that's important later on, uh, why this characterization is important later on. They have significant dominance over entertainment and culture as well, right? We watch Hollywood, we listen to English songs, and we speak English on a daily basis. So at some level, they have that soft power over all of our lives, right? What will these comments look like from coming from these nations, right? It looks like nations projecting, uh, these countries will project their value, i.e., uh, in, in all forms of political commentary, like the news channel on BBC talking about Venezuela, the institutional problems about uh, Russia, uh, uh, the BBC talking about Burma's uh, democracy, et cetera, et cetera, right? We think those universal values, so long as they're positive, uh, 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 so long as they're positive in nature to a particular nation, mm -hmm. obviously they should be allowed for. Why is this true and why is it very important and why is it principally justified? Firstly, principle justification. We, we, we believe that nations who are previously like very egregious in their exploitations of other nations would actually have a very significant chance to rectify previous harms by making it for uh, making up for it now by being a force for good in the world using their soft influence to actually push nation uh, to actually actually comment and, and uh, drive their domestic discourse towards support of budding new uh, uh, democracies without actually shitting on them or without actually criticizing them very, uh, without criticizing them uh, insultingly, right? So what's the impact of, of, of this uh, a particular argument, right? It is important to uphold like human rights and democracy across the world because simply because these nations uh, have very strong political support and global influence over the world. This looks like the previous speaker of the house in the United States, Paul Ryan, uh, calling in support of the release of the previously incarcerated leader of opposition of Malaysia, right? He's called, he called Anwar to be released further uh, some time back because when he was uh, in prison, right? Or it looks like the US or the UK calling on Burma to actually restore democracy and criticizing the Tat Mahdol in their domestic circles and their in domestic news media channels and political discourse online or wherever, et cetera, et cetera, and on the media, right? Reason why this is important and why this is true in supporting and restoring this kind of particular good values and good democracy is because they are a political rallying point for like effective change in the political landscape, right? Notice that a lot of people uh, who are op currently oppressed in post-colonial, uh, in, in previous uh, colonies, they are actually oppressed not because they are incapable or that they are plainly stupid. It's because they're living an institutional power yoke on their necks where they can't even move anything. This looks like the Hong Kong or Taiwan when they want to have pro-democracy protests, but they can't really have effective institutional constitutional change because of the oppression mm -hmm. by China of a bigger power that's oppressing them. Uh, yeah, but before that, yes. Op opening opposition talked about human rights as if independent countries don't have enough institutionalized check and balance system or political system that would support the human rights abuses, for example, in their government. I've already given you the characterization that some nations do not have that check and balance system. And also, it's not true that universally everybody has human rights and they are automatically enforced. This looks like nations in Zimbabwe where there's like a literal authoritarian dictators ruling over the nations. And, and you want to justify a world where these kind of post colonial past who had a hand in contributing to their dictatorship and not do anything. We think it's not justified. Uh, no, thank you. Right. Why is it true? And uh, why is it true that uh, political domestic support would actually rally and garner up that more political change. Why? Because you can garner more sympathy and uh, more political capital to push their own domestic governments to help and lend a helping hand, right? People want uh, it looks like people wanting to help other nations even more, i.e. like in Africa, the Bill and Marina Gates Foundation, uh, and it looks like Hong Kong and Taiwan aligning more with the West by, you know, foreign aid or uh, 
in the future because you, you garner this political capital. Why is this important? Because recognize some of them are institutional locks and it's very important to actually lift those uh, uh, yokes, especially if you had a hand in contributing on them. Regarding messianic tendencies, we don't think this would automatically happen because government gave no analysis on why these nations would feel like they're the messiahs, simply because these nations cannot individually act on their own particular uh, soft influence or hard influence. Notice that they are in alliances, they are in NATO, they are in other organizations where there are other Western nations looking at them as well. So if the UK tried to, to insult Burmese culture or enforce like their own form of domestic system or France enforcing their own laissez-faire or on Islamic states, we believe that this won't happen simply because other nations would point out their criticism and the hypocrisy of these nations. And also, people on the ground aren't stupid to just believe at, that the US is the uh, instant messiah, right? The colonial agenda in, on the, under the PM speech, he explains that they are minimal at best and corrupt at worst. Sure, corrupt agendas are bad, like Chinese narratives, but the allies in the West rally behind US policies, and there's an international check and balance system using the justice system and the international societies uh, as a whole. With that, proud to oppose. Uh, within the further two, I would like to call PPM for this speech here. here. Hello, am I audible? Ah, yes, you are clearly audible. So before I will start my speech, my gender preferred pronouns are he and him. And for the POI, I would like it on the voice. Wait, wait long. Okay, so I will start my speech in three, two, one. Oh, oh, talked about human rights as if independent countries don't have enough institutional checks and balance. Even if they don't have any, how dare you to judge these countries' ideologies in their politics? How sure are you that democracy works for them? How sure are you that communism works for them? These nations have multicultural organizations and formations that is good and working to ensure systematically exhaustion of resources. We say that this is enough because they are living in the present and they still would and they still be potential to live in a future, for example, because oh, oh talk about corruption, human rights, poverty, and political struggle as if these problems are inherent. They did not say that these are products or byproducts of colonialism and neo-colonialism. We want to talk about the struggles of the Cuba, for example. In the hands of Che Guevara, for example, a, revolu a revolutionist against the neo-colonialism. There is revolution, there is political struggle, there could be corruption, and there are human rights abuses from authoritarian regimes because these are the responses to the growing neo-colonialism and at the unfair judgment in the new liberal market brought by the America or brought by the Communist Party of China, for example, in exhausting all our resources as they are the super states that exhaust our countries as expansionist countries. So onto my principle, onto our constructives. Neocolonialism is the practice of using, number one, the economics of each countries and, it, and using their economic ties, for example, in America and the Philippines, and it, global, and it framed as being globalization, as a time of globalization in which they, we don't know that this kind of globalization and economic ties disadvantages underdeveloped countries be, because they are competing with these high-class transnational companies that have been the advantage in the times that they were that they are colonizing this uh, the, this underdeveloped countries and cultural imperialism and conditional aid to influence a country instead of the previous colonial methods of direct military control or imperialism this neocolonialism we can see, we we can we tell you that this is this is just an example of imperialism that would that would control these countries these underdeveloped countries by these countries who have been advantaged because they colonized these countries even just in their hegemony of their commons or in direct political control such as those hegemonies. Neocolonialism differs from the standard globalization and development aid and it typically results in a relationship of dependence, subvergence, or financial obligation towards the neocolonialist nation like what Philippines have uh, in, Philippines and U.S. ties have in common, like the, the like the Philippines offering labor workers for them in exchange of the military support or the bilateral union in a, in the U.S. and Philippine um, and Philippine ties, for example. So, onto my extension in politics. What is sovereignty about and that, the, and that the sovereignty that is happening in the in the market or the sovereignty that is happening in the political and geopolitical landscape of the world is on the China versus USA sovereignty uh, so, so, um, 
war on geopolitical. These are both expansionist countries because they fight against each other to gain the global powers at the expense of devaluing other countries like the Philippines and Taiwan on claiming our West Philippine Sea, for example. On number one, for political hegemony in the uh, on number one on political hegemony in the region, and number two on Chinese economic gains, and number three on land political expansion. What is the problem here? Number one, the Chinese debt trap that would trap each countries underdeveloped countries to be uh, to to engage and hegemonize these countries to engage in their economic activities, for example, in exchange of their debts, for example, and that because these are traps, they were trapped. Uh, they were trapped these countries to not be able to pay their, their debts in exchange, for example, of their land areas or right. water areas. And number two, the geopolitical struggle, which have worsened the pandemic response point, of our point, country point. because the government wants to appease the CCP and the geopolitical relationship in the region. China wants to expand its communist ideals. U.S. wants to protect the democratic ties and their liberal market. On to my analysis, this war only constitutes the both countries' political aims. They are fighting with each other's hegemony by claiming territories on other country, which the impacts are, number one, destabilizing our political institutions as underdeveloped country like the Philippines and Taiwan, and number three, jeopardize our economy like fishermen who can't go to our seas, for example. These neo-colonial countries have no legitimate good intentions to develop our country, and according to my prime minister's standards, with no legitimate good intentions, we have proved to you that neo-colonial countries have no legitimate intention, therefore, they should not comment about us, because why is this important? In judging legitimacy, we have to judge the standard of authenticity, for example, because in commenting such like bilateral ties, for example, we see to it that all both countries have mutual agreement and, of course, the point, mutual benefits. Point. So in commenting like this, it would not have the mutual benefits to other countries because it would only favor those who have the power, like the U.S. and China. So the politics in the Philippines, it influences Philippines through military ties, their bilateral ties on military trainings and warfare equipment, for example. For example, the dollar Trump administration have denied us this kind of bilateral union because because the Duterte administration have jailed have jailed Senator De Lima for example and they claim it as a political uh, as a political intrusion and it is very harmful because it could trickle down onto our economy and it is trickle down onto our political dependence because of that kind just a small tie for example in military equipments and warfare. USA uh, have been able to influence our government and our political uh, and our political landscape. So POI. I'll ask it again. Do you think the Palestinian government should have the ability to criticize the government of Israel? You're talking about neo-colonialism. This is it. Of Okay, I will I will explain to that onto my economic extension. But the communication ambiguity of U.S. versus China in Taiwan, for example, their comments could have a harsh impact on these standards because this communication ambiguity don't have legal standards onto it, but on the comment, uh, but on the uh, on the operation of the comments and ambiguity in the U.S. versus China in Taiwan, and it, it operates only on comments and such statements. On the economic extension, we politely refer to as underdeveloped in truth, our colonial, semi-colonial, or dependent countries. We are countries whose economics have been distorted by imperialism, which has abnormally developed these branches of industry or agriculture needed to complement its complex economy. Che Guevara is another famous opponent of neocolonialism, and most people who use the word neocolonialism and believe it describes the world today are socialists, for example. So what is in the neoliberal market and how transnational companies are significant advantage to comparison to our domestic industries? They were advanced in labor work, in tools and equipment incentivizes more production, and how their comments support their market. These comments are only in favor of the market of the USA, for example, in pressuring underdeveloped countries to support our cut aids as U.S. investment continues to play an important role in the Philippine economy while a strong security relationship rests on the mutual defense treaty because on the long-term benefit, Revolution of power struggles and poor versus rich struggle can be prevented on our side because how is this possible? Like what happened to Cuba before in revolution of Che Guevara, in which the new liberal market have proved to be very negative in the growth of Cuba, Cuba, and, they, and this is and this is why revolution is possible on their side. And that we are proud to propose. Uh, within the further deal, I'm calling up on the dialogue for ending up the upper house pitch here, here. Uh, mm. Yellow, you can start your speech. Right, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are clearly audible. Right, um, sorry, yeah. 
I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, a couple of things I'm going to be doing in my debate, in my speech. Firstly, I'm going to point out and rectify the contradiction that exists in PM's speech about how, why there will be somehow increased dependence and at the same time, there will not be any increased dependence and they will reach it at the same time. And notice that this premise is based on the example of Philippines. I don't understand how both of these things can be mutually, can ex exist at the same time. And even if it does, I'm going to show you why those impacts don't necessarily happen and why we still win the debate. But secondly, I'm going to talk about um, this institutional check and balances um, comment that comes from um, that comes from government that seems to be the premise of their of their moral justification of why we shouldn't comment on those um on, on those foreign countries right on the basis of sovereignty thirdly i'm going to talk about this whole weird new colonialism argument and talk and and argue why it's not exactly in the debate and even if it is in the debate why sometimes new colonialism can actually be good and fourthly talk about the principle which the government never really dealt with Right. Firstly, about this contradiction between these misguided tendencies of people to feel lesser and people to be more reliant. But at the same time, they say that people, that states are more likely to be reclusive on, um, on the basis of the example of Philippines. Right? Notice that firstly, the idea that people will be more reliant and the idea that people would retreat is fundamentally contradictory because you're talking about two different kinds of ties. Right? Either one, you increase your relationship or you increase your reliance or, in de or dependence onto the other country. And the second, you increase your independence of that um, former colonial country. Both cannot be true at the same time. And even if it does, I'm going to tell you why. Um, why it's necessary, why, why it's not, um, is that, why it doesn't help um, Gulf states. So firstly, on this idea of Mazzani tendencies. So firstly, notice that there is no analysis onto why people would suddenly cling onto or feel lesser just because um, um, this, just because these countries have Mazzani tendencies. Notice that people can feel Mazzani um, notice that there, there already are people who notice just because these countries um, have some kind of mezzanine tendencies or mezzanine uh, complex doesn't mean that, that their former colonies would somehow feel that they are less compared to the other countries. We say that even if it does, right, um, it already, those things already happen already, right? People already feel some kind of subservience towards their former colonies um, for, because, just because of by virtue of their more, de, just because they're more developed or um, of have better institutions, right? But, um, Secondly, right, um, we don't think we think that even if they do, even if right, even if they, they do somehow develop some kinds of complex or somehow feel lesser towards these um um their, their former colonies, it's not a necessarily bad thing. Why? Because firstly, they would be more susceptible to accept any commentary or any influence coming from those countries. And um, and those influence can be good. Like Isaac's give you many different reasons as to why um the, the kind of commentary no, that know. exists under former colonies are necessarily good for, for those countries. Um, in terms of um universal check and balances. Um, just commenting on the, the state of political turmoil coming from within those countries or any kind of political dialogue that exists within those countries, right? But secondly, on this idea of them retreating, right? Um, so firstly, um, you the their whole argument talked about new the, the whole of DPM's argument talked about new colonialism and why people hate new colonialism and that's why they don't want more undue influence. We don't understand why then they would necessarily retreat onto those foreign countries to to get um to, to get more influence by by those foreign countries, right? So I think that one is a fundamental contradiction that they need to resolve. But secondly, even even then, I think it's fine because um at least in the end of the day, there will be some kind of change when they retreat or seek out other independent actors, right? Um, at the very firstly, they would have some form of discourse within their country about the direction their country is taking, and we think that is necessary because we don't think political stagnancy in any form or manner is necessarily good because at the very least, when you have discourse from other in discourse about the direction your country is taking you will see, you will internet you will check, you will like make use of the internet of those um, domestic institutions check and balances to improve the state of your own politics or to redress your own grievances but secondly um we think that at the very least on the other side there will be some kind of institutional change right on the their side there will be no form of institutional change and this leads on to my second response and my second argument what about this institutional check and balance that exists under those countries and before that i'll take a i'll take a poi from closing Okay, you still haven't proved to us on our side why necessarily these colonizer countries have any incentive to do reparations for what they did in the past. Rather, what happens is if the quo is they push neocolonism and still exploit our resources and people on the ground. Why necessarily is your case then true? Um, so I know this is a bit lame, but I'm going to be responding it into, I, I'll be integrating it into my responses later on. Okay, so firstly about this institutional check and balances. Notice that under Isaac's speech, we told you, we gave you structural reasons why the institutional check and balances of these countries don't necessarily work, or two, why the democracies are fundamentally flawed, or why three, the political like crises or political discourse 
uh, inherently harmful or ma towards marginalized or minority communities within their world as a remnant of colonial policies, right? Like Britain's whole whole idea of rule and conquer, of divide and conquer, where they divide minorities and uh, minority companies according to regions and causing like different social economic levels of development, which causes the kind of racial discourse that exists within those countries or the underdevelopment of those countries and why they have such weak institutional systems, right? So firstly, we think that the reason why, that the reason why, uh, that since colonial countries are the reason why these institutional reform institutions are so weak in the first place, means that there is a moral duty for these um, former colonies to rectify those kinds of um, institutional, um, to rectify those kinds of institu institutional um, um, flaws. But secondly, we think that since we draw the line between a uh, foreign invasion or any kind of physical interference, be it economic sanctions, etc., this is the only way that you could actually interfere without causing, without infringing on the sovereignty of those countries that governments so want to um, so want to protect. Right? But secondly, this whole idea that how dare you say that democracy is not a good thing, how dare you say that they want some kind of authoritarian dictatorship. We think that firstly, this comes from position of privilege, right? You are only able to say this given that you are a part of the existing power structure that exists, right? You can only say that you don't want democracy because you are part of the authority, because your ethnic, um, because your ethnic identity is part of the um, existing power structure that, that governs your country that inherently benefits your existing your, your, your ethnic community, right? But secondly, they, this notice that this that this ultimately harms minorities and marginalized communities as a whole. Like they told you that, oh, Philippines want the drug war. They want police officers to kill people on site just because they're susceptible of being, just because they are, just, be, just because they're suspect of being drug offenders. Firstly, this ultimately harms the poor and people who are forced into um, drug abuse in the first place. But secondly, this causes a bandit policy of people using for people using only short-term solutions to solve their problems. And thirdly, this ultimately proves to you why they don't have proper systems of check and balance and where they don't have proper um, full, full democracy because of this crude incentive for them to just kill people instead of using discourse or other policies to resolve that solution. But fourthly, on this idea of neocolonialism, firstly, we think that neocolonialism is not in the debate because we're just talking about commenting and projecting soft inputs, whatever. Their argument about China putting people into debt trap, etc., is not even a relationship between former colonizers and colonizers. Um, because China does not have any relationship with the African Union, right? Um, they're just um, neighboring countries. But secondly, I don't think neocolonialism would be any any worse on the other side because um, in the end of the day, you are not expanding your economic influence on other people or use your military power, etc. And for that, I've never been proud of it. Uh, we in the further deal, I would like to call upon the member of government to start the lower house case. Here, here. Hi, can I check them audible? Uh, yes, you're clear your audio. All right, thank you. Um, so once again, I'll take my POIs verbally, uh, preferably between five and six minutes. So just unmute whenever you're ready. And um, I'll give, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. In my speech today, I'll be doing a few things. I'll be taking out the entire opening house, bringing it back into the closing half of the debate today, preempting what closing opposition might tell you and providing you the, um, naturally the extensions coming out of side closing government and telling you why we differ from open government and take it back for us today. First of all, let's take care of what has come out of the opening exchange today. First of all, what has come out of opening opposition? I think opening opposition's case is one that's very assertive and missing a lot of links, right? Few things. Number one, they claim to be that, that these uh, colonizer countries in the first place have a moral incentive to want to rectify previous harms they have caused. Note that panel, they have not given you number one any link or why they have this, as I've already explained in my POI, that within status quo, rather what they do is continue doing things like neo-colonialism and exploitative use of resources and individuals on the ground within ex-colonies in the past, right? Number two, they also never proved to us why necessarily they are able to change authoritarian authoritative states into democracies in the first place, just by giving them, for example, commenting on the dom domestic politics, right? Minimal products the incentive to, to why this authoritative so, to why these authoritative states want to listen to them in the first place, so I don't see how they're able to aid, eat those harms, right? Note that the main bulk of their case is contingent upon the fact that these colonies or past colonies want to listen to these ex-colonizers in the first place, right? In my speech today, I'll prove to you why, number one, they're unlikely to want to listen to them, but number two, even if they listen to them, why it's necessarily bad for the colonies, and number three, even if the advice is not in the best interest of the colonizers in the first place, why it's still bad for the colonies in the first place, right? You think that I want to talk about it. But first of all, right, let's talk about what opening government brought to you. 
the Tochi of few things. Number one, they explain that sovereignty is not achieved because there'll be no benefit for international relations because these countries are likely to make policies that only benefit the colonizers. We think that, yes, this is true to a certain extent, but they do not push the moral imperative of sovereignty enough. And that's what I'll do in my speech today as well. Number two, they also tell you in opening government that um, Basically, the policies that come in destroy things like democracy and multi-partisanship not take you later. I think this is, this is not necessarily wrong either, but I don't think the push analysis far enough and explain to you the types of harms that happen and why structurally the power dynamics are too different. That's what I'll tell you in my lecture today. So let's get straight into it, right? First thing, understand the point at which you let colonizers give you advice and tell you what to do with your democracy is the point at which you are perpetrating a hierarchy once again. What does this look like? It means that individuals on the ground who were once colon who were once colonists in the first place and had to listen to their colonial masters, now necessarily are allowing new colonialism to happen in the first place. That means leaders of these countries on the ground are being complicit to neo colonialism and allowing it to happen to their people. What is this necessary that is for a few reasons? Number one, we think in most colonies, there is an anti-colonizer sentiment. Why is this so not articulated? This is because in the past, colonizers have left other countries in shambles, right? Like the other countries are not doing very well right now because of how exploitative they were in the past. I don't necessarily see why it is morally correct for them, for them to be the one advising you about how to run your country since they didn't do such a good job in the past. I think if anything, their past actions are good enough example and good enough, like, uh, good enough, right? basically good enough example to show you what they will do to you. They are more likely they're not going to exploit you and use bad things on you. We see that happening, what is happening when you say this for now, I don't see why it's morally correct. But second of all, right, understand even the point at which they make comments which are uh, which only propagate things like democracy or human rights, why it's not necessarily the best thing for the colonies on the ground is because of how different the political systems and systems on the ground are. What does this look like? Understand systems like bipartisanship or systems of how democracy works in, for example, the United Kingdom don't necessarily work in, for example, countries like Malaysia because of how our races work here, right? The, the, the amount of races we have in Malaysia is something that's not available to them in the United Kingdom and something that their policy just cannot take account for. What this means is that they are more likely they're not going to split across races cause more racial tensions and cause more conflicts to happen on the ground because the types of policies that they push more often than not benefit the majority that happens in the country. We see this with large amounts of racism and xenophobia that happen in these colonizing countries. I don't see why you necessarily want to want you want to import these sorts of narratives in the first place, right? Understand side opening opposition's case eats itself because they explain the amount of influence and soft power these individuals have on you. That means the point at which you don't want to listen to you, that means on your side of the debate today, they are unable to say, I don't want to listen to these comments anymore, the point at which they allow these policies to be made and they allow these trade deals to be made. Because now they hold influence to you and you're forced to listen to what they have to say to you. I don't see why this is necessarily good. But second of all, right, understand that they also don't have a full understanding of what's happening on the ground. That means, and this is an extension to what side opening government told you as well, they might not understand what's best for the people on the ground. Yes, maybe human rights are important. Yes, maybe a democracy is important. But is that the most urgent matter for developing countries in the first place? Understand, different countries have different importance. There's different things that need to catch the urgency of the government in the first place, I don't see why necessarily Big Brother over there in the West understands what we need on the ground. I would rather say individuals on the ground are able to vote for the government, which is able to provide them the best possible alternative for people on the ground. I think there's something that comes up mutually exclusive our closing government. I'm able to explain to you why even if they provide even if they provide to you benefits that do not, uh, they provide to you comments that do not benefit the colonizers in the first place, why necessarily it doesn't work for the colonies anyway. But third of all, right, understand there's only two outcomes that come out of the side of uh, opening opposition. But before I got that, sure, I'll take the uh, opening spiel. Are you saying that when people are living in fear and under torture in Zimbabwe, just because the US talked about democracy, somehow they don't care about democracy? And secondly, are you saying human rights are culturally inc incompatible to ex colonies? Two things. First of all, you never prove to me why you commenting on their you commenting on their lack of democracy necessarily changes anything, right? Rather, I think it propagates more harm because it propagates more aggression. The point at which is authoritarian state authoritative states sees that large big brothers want to go and attack them, right? I think it's not necessarily better for the people on the ground. But anyway, let me move back to my point, right? Two possible outcomes coming out of the case. First of all, if you listen to the case, if you listen to the comments, right, of what the people come up, of what they say from the West, this means a few things. Number one, you become a proxy. That means that soft power is able to be influenced on you, you necessarily become a colony once again. Morally, I think we can say this is already wrong. But number two, the point at which you do not listen, right? I think two things happen here. One is you are necessarily forced to listen in the first place because of the trade ties that you already made with them. We say at least on our side, if we don't listen to the comments, they have an incentive to protect us because of the resources we have and the point at which they exploit us to too much of an extent, we go to countries like China, right? I don't see why that's necessarily bad for us. But number two, the point at which that happens, uh, understand that they, them still exploiting us in status quo means it's morally wrong for leaders of a 
country to leave their people in exploitation and still listen to what those countries want to say in the first place. What side opposing opposition has to prove to us in their case today is why morally it's still correct for you to listen to the, to the examples and advice of these people who are in the first place, the ones that left you in such harm. So I think coming out of what CEO has POI'd you so far, they keep on asking you, right? Why does, is it justified then for Palestine to comment Israel? I think this is a very cherry-picked example in and of itself, right? Because understand that this is still happening now. This is not about past colonizers. But even so, what would happen on your side if you want to talk about Israel or Palestine would mean that the point at which Palestine does not become a colony of Israel, that means Israel should be able to comment on how Palestine uh, democracy works. I don't see why that's necessarily good. You have to prove it to me on CEO. I think CGK is the case back today. Thank you. Uh, within the further due, I would like to call a uh, member of opposition to start CEO, please. Here, here. Hey, uh, POIs in the chat, please. Uh, but if it's past five minutes, then you can start uh, asking me verbally. Yeah. Uh, cool, let's get the chat up and I'll time myself. Oh shit, my phone's buzzing. I will turn that sound off. Okay, split. Where am I doing? Starting in three, two, one. Panel, it was crushing that OG did not respond to Oscar's POI about Israel. It was crushing that OO and CG only wanted to talk about the Philippines and Malaysia. The whole debate so far has been premised on a certain amount of territories with a certain dynamic. That is not what all uh, ex territories and colonies looks like. Before I move into my two pieces of extension, just some framing in terms of how this debate should be judged. Note, even if we prove the one cherry picked example, which was CG's response to our POI, we win. The topic is never, we prove one, and that means I think Opbench probably gets up in the case, even if you believe some good government analysis. Second is to find legitimate. We hear, like, an OG, a weird definition, which I'll get up. It's in the best interest of both parties. I think that's way too high to define legitimate. We give you two categories which are more realistic. Firstly, it's done in good faith. That is, if you do something to try to be good, which may, obviously knows the response to CG saying it won't do well in the consequence. If you try to do it well, it's legitimate. Secondly, if there's a reasonable chance of succeeding, it is also legitimate. We don't have a high bar to prove this will always work in all countries. If we improve, maybe it's got a 60% chance of working in some countries. CO does get up. It's unfortunately word a topic but I think that is a fair way to judge it. Also not on CG's case before I move on because I think I've dealt with the opening half so far. They don't really meet their burden they just say it's not effective does not mean it's not legitimate as I've just told you in my framing. Two extensions coming out of CO e either or are probably debate winning. Firstly we're going to talk about different types of states that is states with parity uh, with, with their colonizing uh, states, not states with the power and balance, which every other team in the debate so far has presumed. It also means the parity can be switched, right? I'm going to explain this more. Okay, what are some reasons why colonial states can exist on the same level geopolitically as their ex-colonies? A few reasons. Firstly, we give the example of Australia and more broadly, that are states that were fully colonized, that is completely at the extent of their, like at the expense of their indigenous populations, Australia or Canada. This means there is a pervasive racial attitude in this country that aligns with the colonizing power. That is, there is a support for democracy and British traditions that are the same as in the colonial power. That means this colonial power is more likely to help this country get their independence and treat them well and help them on their path um, as opposed to continuous mutual support. That means Australia and Canada have been able to move themselves up geopolitically because they've had the help of the colonial power historically. Secondly, other colonies got their independence a long time ago. See, for example, China, which probably got like, had a lot of independence probably post 1920 or post 1930. That is to say, a significant amount of time, that is about 100 years, some good governments and some good luck, which you have to accept does exist in some post colonial countries. That means countries will be able to rise up to a significant extent that, that they can probably rival declining powers like the UK, perhaps supersede them like China. 
Thirdly, this isn't only about colonies. Sometimes co territories, which is why our POI Palestinian applies, our territories, not necessarily colonies, it is in, in the topic. Sometimes the territories were held marginally. That is, it was contingent on the support of an ex-colonial state like Britain in the Middle East. Maybe it was held on a very marginal thing like tribal conflict and the colonial strength wasn't that hard. That means it is quite easy to switch that power dynamic, like in Palestine, uh, Palestine and Israel, also like in Mongolia, right? Mongolia had heaps of territories. It has changed over time. It has changed because like military sucks and they didn't have like guns and the ability to commit genocide and stuff like that. That is why it changes. What uh, that what what are the impacts of this? Before I go on, note this debate isn't just now. It is a principal consideration of whether something is legitimate, uh, never legitimate. That is, this debate can still exist and does still still exist in 50 years' time when all the reasons I gave you become more and more amplified. We win in the long term. Three impacts of this. Firstly, this framing it avoids all of OG and OO. Secondly, it means states can't comment on their major strategic partners. That is, Australia and the UK work together a lot. You cannot comment on that, which is particularly harmful in the way you coordinate international efforts. Thirdly, I think Europe and, and in, an example of China is a billion people, billion and a half people, it matters like numbers wise. Europe will be quite literally paralyzed in dealing with China given like that four years. European states dealt with them. Fourthly, actively victimized states continue to perpetually victimize before we move on. I'll take that POI. I think it's an opening. We have proved to you that power struggles, products, i.e. human rights abuses, oppression, were brought by colonialism and these states are still neo-colonizers in the present. That is why we invalidate all their stances, because to begin with, they are the, the reason of instabilities of their former colonies. But we just told you why some states aren't unstable, right? Like, that's cool. Your PI doesn't respond to any of my material. Like, even if we have three, three states, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, we still win this debate. They're ex-colonies. That was, that was weird, all right. Okay, why do we think the help is in a good way? This does play into the paradigm the rest of the day, and this does play into the paradigm of that POI, so maybe I'll be more charitable here. OWO talks about how countries have a chance to move forward, that they have a chance to talk about human rights in a good way, and, they and there's talk of checks and balances and things like that. No team structurally and analyzes anything. Also, OWO's principle of like helping pe people you've currently victimized is contingent on the analysis that states are likely to help these countries. Why are countries incentivized, like this is best structural analysis of the debate by far, to help them? First is a shared culture and religion, often race in certain countries, which means there's soft sympathy. You identify these people as religious brothers or race, racial brothers and stuff like that. There is that small connection, probably not less material. Secondly, and crucially, there are electoral incentives to helping ex-colonial states. Firstly, there's a lot of immigration from from colonized states to the, to the colonizers because of economic reasons, because of language like in India that the British Empire was glorifying. That means there's now a significant voter base in these countries that vote for you if you support their home country. Note in like French Algeria, Algerians had French citizenship, they can vote. This will become more and more relevant over time. Secondly, you like this? strong anti-colonial discourse in these countries. That everyone in this debate knows colonialism is bad. The left is quite strong on this. People are likely to vote. Also, not these large immigrant communities will talk to their friends and this can disperse beyond the communities themselves. Thirdly, everybody else in this debate has talked about how colonizers profit off their ex colonies. What that means is you don't want to piss off these countries to a certain extent, right? To the extent that there's some degree of anti colonial sentiment in these countries, you don't want that to be breached beyond the tipping point of revolution or referendum. What this means is that the comment is likely to be good, is likely to be supportive. Crucial example here. In New Caledonia, there's been three referendums in the last four years, or there's one coming up soon, as to whether they should become independent from France, as a lot of countries have this. There's a genuine need and a genuine desire to understand how France will help them post-colonization. That is why people need the comments of France, the comments on the political policies of their leaders, to allow them to make good decisions, to allow themselves to emerge from decolonization. Lastly, we think it also acts as a deterrent. This is the third extension, a few sentences. The Rwanda genocide could have been stopped by stronger uh, Belgian discourse because Belgium has the greatest stake, and they, and they prove this in their action in stopping genocides in their former colonial powers. It acts as a deterrent to genocides and extremism. Three extensions, proud, proud, proud. Uh, within the further deal, I would like to call government with to close over the government case here. here. Mm, hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. All right, cool. Um, hang on, let me get my paper, my timer. Um, 
Uh, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. I think the vast majority of the harms and the literal principle that my member brought up to you have gone highly con uncontested in today's debate. I think also the re simplest reason why we outweigh like CO in the first place is their arguments and the literal people that they pick to protect are not only very specific and a very small number, but also that these countries, they've never proved the urgency as to why these countries need help or intervention in the first place. I'd also like to question their picking of like Palestine as like a territory and all that, like Palestine, Israel being a territory of Palestine in previous years, because I think the word territory, especially in the case of today's debate, extends to far more things than just land, right? This looks like things like whether they've actually colonized the people who li now live in those lands. I think it's unfair for you to just posit that and fiat that by virtue of like, them being a territory to some extent, right? Um, I think my task in today's debate is very simple. I think my first member has already talk, taken out OO very sufficiently, and maybe I'll talk about it a bit more, but very unlikely. So here's the two things, the two things I'll be um, prioritizing. First, um, CO, I think I've talked a little bit already about them, but also OG. I'm going to tell you specifically how we outweigh OG insofar as our case is different, is unique, and is specific in targeting the most vulnerable groups of people, i.e. the vast majority of countries and colonies that exist in status quo, right? The vast majority of countries who need help and who are, can be influenced by these um, liberal democracies to a negative way. Um, first off, uh, like a general commentary of what we said, right? We told you specifically how comments give unfair capital for big countries and to use this as a threat against their colonies, right? So I, you don't listen to my comment, uh, like, hold sanctions or you or whatnot, right? I think this is really specific. So insofar as our principle still stands, uh, insofar as our principle falls, then like intervention to some extent is like perpetrated on the side opposition side. And that's really negative for all the harms of colonialism on a principle and practical standpoint. My first speaker has already talked about that, right? So let's see how we outweigh CO. Mm -hmm. um, first, I, I think this was a bit harmful because this was the only argument that I would say legitimately was in this debate, i.e. the principle that trying to be good and attempt at being good is a legitimate attempt. And insofar as they attempted to be good, their purpose was um, righteous, then it should be allowed. I think that the easiest way for this principle to fall is that um, even if they, are, they try to be good, A, eh, um, it's just it just doesn't always end up that way, right? We already told you specifically how there are three requirements as to how you give beneficial comments. A, epistemic access to the things on the ground. B, no uh, specific knowledge on the nuances of how these governments work and all the intricacies of how the politics work and how the economies work and whether certain things can be implemented to begin with and see just a natural incentive for these governments to give half a fuck about like the vast majority of people in these countries, right? Note, here's the arguments that CEO then tries to use as a practical, right? Um, a, that these countries have an incentive to help because like um, there's like voter bases, they have cultural ties, um, I don't think this is really specific to the vast majority of countries. Even if these people go, um, um, they're like immigrants that come to these countries and that's a large voter base. I think more often than not, the main priority for these countries is like to be rich for themselves. It's very unlikely that they want to sacrifice any form of their benefit to help other countries, especially their colonizers, who they're more likely to want to mon monopolize and exploit to begin with, right? I just think those arguments and those extensions were really problematic to begin with in characterization, right? Um, so I think this nicely takes down a lot of the arguments on closing opposition insofar as they talk about like they don't prove to us things like the urgency of the, con the specific countries they're trying to help because all the countries they're talking about like really developed countries already and there's no urgency for helping these countries and also note that like more often than not the benefits of side opposition to begin with is on the basis that like there's operational change in like really conservative and really authoritative states. I'll be talking more about this later when I talk about OO, right? Um, okay, let's just get into OO now. I think, as my first speaker has already said, like my member, he's already specified to you how a lot of the arguments and benefits are predicated on really terrible states listening to the government. Um, he's already rebutted this to a sufficient extent, but I'm going to take this further, right? I'm going to tell you that the point at which authoritative states, like you try to comment on them and say, hey, this is bad, or hey, you shouldn't be doing this, hey, you should be doing this instead. This key point at which authoritative states can be even more authoritative, right? What does this look like? This looks like them just saying, hey, 
um, look, the West is trying to um, exploit us. They're trying to make us more like them. They're bad. Let's like shit on the West. Shit West, West bad. So this leads to like really large anti-West sen sentiments and this negative. Because note that our case is literally that we want there to be equality on the ground. The point at which you shut off the West in, in its entirety and the people on the ground hate the West, literally all the benefits that side opposition tries to propagate and perpetuate just don't exist, right? I think this is the easiest way to take out opposing opposition. To the point at which your benefits are predicated on you achieving some form of change in authority of the states, if that can't happen, then your case just falls, right? Um, also note that like on principle, this, this principle is really, really important, by the way, because it's a value judgment debate to begin with, that my first speaker told you, he specified to you specifically how like there's liberal, um, like liberal democracies in the West, colonizers in general, have literally torn apart our countries, and it's just unfair for them to try and come in, even if they have like best intentions in mind. It's just unfair for them to come in and say, okay, hey, you should do these things this way. No. Um, this is where like um we contest highly with like opening opposition, right? We tell you specifically how, insofar as they comment by virtue of their existing hierarchy, you not only perpetuate that hierarchy, but more often than not, these comments are demeaning, right? Because it's really problematic to assume and speculate that, like, hey, by virtue of me commenting, it'll be viewed in an objective stance. What does this look like instead? This looks like colonizing countries saying, hey, you are problematic, you should do this instead. So this perpetuates the idea that these governments need to be shut down or these governments are ineffective. What does this lead to? This is also a specific extension coming from a member of opposition, right? This is how we outweigh um, opening government. We tell you specifically how these um, this nuances and existence of hierarchy becomes even more perpetuated and these countries have less of a capacity to deal with these countries. So what does this look like? This looks like, um, hang on, this looks like um, A. So for example, Malaysia opens up to Britain, like Britain comments on Malaysia's policies. So if in the, far, in the case that Malaysia listens to this um, um, comment, then they try to implement that comment. They open up so that the British can help them with that comment. And then they become liable to the British, right? Because the British have helped them to some extent. It gives the British like a liberal and righteous standpoint over Malaysia. I, I have helped you, therefore you should listen to me. You are liable to me. We have relationships. And there's like a, just a vast power dynamic that's really harmful to begin with. That's where we take over like OG. So let me tell you specifically how we outweigh OG, right? First, we tell you that it's far too little analysis in OG that we bring up. We told you what's the problem behind the principle of why colonialism specifically is bad. We give you nuances as to how colonialism works and how countries and governments fundamentally works and how that's important in giving a commentary in the first place. And these governments, liberal democracies, don't have access to that. We told you how it legitimizes governments to put pressures on colonies insofar as our principle falls. We also tell you what's wrong, even in the best case that these countries listen to them, it looks like puppet governments and proxy wars and just anti-West sent sentiments rising up your forefront, right? We already also give you why benefits of governments are not the most important benefits for these people in the first place. Like liberal democracies don't have the same priorities that like our countries do. And I think it's really important that you note know everything I'm of uh, opposition is that a uh, member of government because he's given a really great speech. Uh, within the fourth ado, I would like to call up on the opposition whip to close the speech. Great. I'm just going to set myself up um what i'm gonna ask for is that no one uh, um unmute themselves to ask a poi because um it really interrupts me I, please just write it in the chat um all right am i audible uh yes you're audible thanks um i'm gonna start my speech in three two one the government bench are quite afraid of two critical words in their burden in this debate. The first, never. The second, legitimate. And I think that's pretty devastating for them in this debate. CO are the only team who give you an account of both of these words and how they're relevant to the debate. For that reason alone, we ought to go through. I'm going to do four things in this speech. First, I'm going to speak a bit about burdens. The second, I'm going to address the worst case where the state in question has an, a clear power dynamic over the, the other state, the third case is where they don't, which is a unique um, point that we give you at CO to very little response from any other team. And fourthly, I'm going to talk a bit about neocolonialism. Let's start with burdens. The word never was an important one in this debate because it was not enough to prove that in some cases it might be illegitimate to criticise another state. OG tried to pursue this by saying that there are instances in, for instance, the Philippines, where it would be probably bad for the, some state like the US to intervene into the political system. They then refused to engage with POIs where we point out that there might be other cases where there is legitimacy. If we were able to prove that those some, there were some cases, even one, 
in which are rightly legitimate, they lose, despite all of this material, Owo never really get there to pointing out this burden, or they never really get there to proving the incentives for why states that had a power dynamic or that didn't might have good reasons for doing so or might be able to be helpful. The other word is legitimate. Independent of outcomes, Luke gives you the clear things, good faith and like possibly likely to make a difference. That is what legitimacy should mean in this debate. I think every other team has refused to define that. All right. When, did, when the state had economic and political power over another, were there cases where it could be legitimate to comment? The first way that OG tried to pursue an answer to this question is to say that it, there is, um, it, it like reinforces cultural imperialism, e.g. in the Philippines. Point out there that that's obviously victim to the burden problem. But I think this is a point where I want to point out the culture mechanism in Luke's extension. In fact, it, culture was a specific reason why post-colonial states would have a continued relationship with their colonial oppressor, as it were. For instance, um, France has a similar, has like basically exported its culture to Africa, has a good reason because of a shared culture between those states and continued immigration between those states to, uh, have it have the interests of those countries at heart we gave you examples of this belgium was the only country that cared about uganda during its genocide or was one of the few countries that was willing to provide it legitimate aid as a post-colonial oppressor in fact we think cultural imperialism was actually a reason why it was likely that it, it would be done in good faith and unfortunately this was extremely unimpacted why did hollywood have harms this was genuinely unclear then the second way they try to pursue it is they say that it makes political upheavals worse due to in interference with nascent institutions. The first thing I want to point out a bit about this is it was drastically under mechanized. In contrast, CEO give you six reasons why states might have incentives to, to strengthen political institutions to provide aid when it might be legitimate to do so and to comment on things in good faith. Those were one, shared language, two, cultural ties, three, immigration, four, religion, five, economic interdependence, and six, internal dissent mechanisms that might exist. CG's response is that these, any of these mechanisms don't explain why uh, this would happen. Uh, they won't sacrifice their interests, but these explain specifically why their interests were tied to the post-colonial state. This explains why they were likely to help them. The economic interdependence mechanism specifically explains this. They often had shared currency. They often had shared immigration. That was exactly the reason why these countries were likely to have good interests. Weigh, weighing against OO there, they basically say, oh, well, these are universal values. And I don't think that was that persuasive compared to all the mechanisms we give you. I said, don't ask them by unmuting. CG, they, they weigh into this by saying that political institutions are incompatible and cannot count. This was a better restatement of OG's premise, basically. And so I think it's a bit derivative. Maybe they give you more incentives. CG member is, is quite big on pointing out the under-mechanization of other teams in the debate. But I think it was a bit of a pot kettle black situation here. It was unclear why incompatible political institutions mean you didn't have the interests of that state you know, at heart or were unlikely to be able to legitimately comment on its state. The other response to this is there are often structural reasons why you might have similar political institutions. Colonialism often means you import your political institutions elsewhere, which means that you're probably going to have compatible political institutions more likely than usual. So this point in the debate completely fell out. Um, so we actually have just then like won the incentives for the worst cases of the government bench and therefore we've won. Then I want to talk about an alternative strategy by which we win the debate. There are other cases, which CEO are the only team that tell you this, is that it might be legitimate because the power dynamic isn't as clear. OG never engage with this question despite two POIs and therefore abdicate their burden. CJ respond, I think with basically one thing, which is to say human rights is not a legitimate reason. They never give you their alternative definition of legitimacy in the round. Luke gives you the best one here, good faith and likely to work. And I think that's the one that ought to be persuasive because he gave reasons for that. And the second one is human rights abuses are probably bad, independent of whether they might have good outcomes for the state. You probably should call those out. There are probably cases, especially when there is no power dynamic between those states, e.g. African territory wars, Mongols commenting on China, that it would be quite legitimate to comment on human rights abuses. So we think that was an alternative way in which we can win the round. And because no other team was willing to give us a response, I think that's another way we can win. I'll take a POI now from opening. 
continued good relationship doesn't exist in your worst case. In your best case that it does, it is only in specialized circumstances like France and New Caledonia, where France is doing that only because of internal pressure. Okay, so you've just conceded the entire debate to CO by saying that. If you've acknowledged there are some cases it might be legitimate, then you have, you agree that it's not never legitimate. Ergo, you lose. I'm so sorry. Neocolonialism, they have one point about this, which is about Chinese debt trap. I think oh, I are correct to point out that it, it was unclear what scope this had in the debate. There are probably many countries that care about China's debt traps, including countries that once colonized them, e.g. the UK probably might have a stake in this. The gov bench thinks they probably should say nothing. What did neocolonialism actually look like? It looked like the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, a former territory of the government of Palestine and of Britain. The government has to support neither country having the ability to criticize Israel for its expansionism. Why was this so harmful? The power imbalance that gov agrees is bad, cannot criticize governments that have taken territory. This is particularly bad. Less likely resistance movements happened then. This was so clearly a way for us to win. They say it's cherry picked. Look at the burden. This is obviously not an insignificant case. There is a structural reason why this would happen. It didn't matter then if this was, you know, an edge case. This was territory, clearly. It was once a sovereign state. So for that reason, we have three ways of winning this debate because we are the only team that actually care about the burden of the motion. Okay, thanks everybody for the nice debate.